Lord, uh, that you would just uh, desire to have that relationship with us, God, to be able to uh, commune with you and talk with you. It's not about religion. It's not just about being part of this building. It's a part of us knowing you and having a relationship that you provided through your son, God. So I just pray, Lord, that you speak to our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, and Lord willing, we'll get through verse 20. The title is called Enter by the Narrow Gate. That's the title this morning. That will be one of the main sections. You may not be aware of this, but in Alaska, there's a little tiny town on the western part of Alaska with about 5,000 people. The name of the town is called Bethel. So you may not know of Bethel. It's, they have the Kushkaquim 300, which is a, slug, uh, a, a sled dog race that travels. And the amazing thing is one thing to realize if you have ever been to Bethel is there is not a road, paved road to get you there. there there's not a dirt road that gets you there. But there is one road that actually does lead to Bethel. It's a snow-packed road, and the only way you can get to Bethel by any land road is through dog sleds. And so they have this, this, this race that they have and pop up there where Anik is. There are the little maps, and so that's the only way you can get to Anik. But they have a race, and it starts at Bethel, and it goes through this one road all the way to Anik. They turn around, they come all the way back. And so it's kind of quite an incredible race. It's a 19-hour race, 300 miles race. And if you were to say there are many roads to get to Bethel, that would be a lie. In fact, if you wanted to know how to get to Bethel, you'd probably want to talk to somebody who's been to Bethel. And they will tell you how you can actually arrive to Bethel. To ask someone who's never been to Bethel how to get there is not going to make any sense. I would take the word of someone who's been to Bethel because not all roads lead to Bethel. And you see, a long time ago, Satan whispered in the ear of man that all roads lead to who? God. That's a very popular world today, right? doesn't matter what your belief is, but all roads lead to God. And there might be 10,000 people that tell you that, but I'd rather take the word of somebody who's been there, who's from there, Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to be talking about, the fact that all roads do not lead to God. And in chapter 7, we realize that Jesus is now wrapping up what we call the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and he's sitting with his disciples, and he tells them there's only one way to God, and that entrance is a narrow entrance, and the path is a difficult path. So read with me verses 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow or the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad or spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Interesting passage. He's, he's telling his disciples, you better enter in by what? The narrow gate, that's how he starts the whole thing, enter in by the narrow gate. See, Jesus here speaks of two gates, a narrow gate and a broad gate. He speaks of two roads or two paths that we talk about. See, in Scripture, a path or a way or a road is normally synonymous to your walk in life. Proverbs 1.10 and 115 say, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. My son, do not walk in the way with them nor keep your foot from their path. So when we talk about roads or ways or a path, it's talking about how you're walking in life, what you're doing, how you're traversing. And Jesus speaks of two ways. One's a broad way and one's a difficult way. And then he speaks of two groups of people. You may not have realized that. He talks about a group that's few. He talks about a group that's many. And then he talks about two destinations, one that ends up in destruction Another one that ends up in life. Four different aspects. Now, I want you to be here because he, Jesus follows me. There's, there's two roads, a broad way and a difficult way, that there's two destinations, life 
and destruction. Now, please note, he did not give a third alternative. Jesus did not give a third way. In other words, there's no middle way, no middle ground, no middle path that you can ever go to to enter and meet God. And this morning, I want you guys to think about this because it's important. Because there's only two baths, that means everyone here is on one path or what? The other. That's what God's Word says. So as we move through this, I want us to be thinking, what path am I on? Am I on the straight and narrow path, or am I on the broad path? And so he says in verse 713, enter in by the narrow gate. And so he's telling his disciples, be sure you enter in by the narrow gate. So in other words, the road that you're on is based upon the gate that you walk through. The purpose of a gate is to open up and to continue on a path, right? And so what gate is it that you've opened up? What gate are you on this morning? And the reality is this. If you haven't entered in through the narrow gate, then you've already have gone through the broad gate, the wide gate this morning. And it's interesting because we're all on one road. You can't be neutral. So this morning we're going to be talking about eternal life, and you can't be neutral about eternal life. A lot of people try to be. A lot of people try to draw, think they're on two roads. They got the road in the worldly broad way, and then they, they say they got their foot in, in another way. And you can't. There is no third way. You're either one or the other. And one's going to lead to destruction or hell, and the other one's going to lead to life, a full purposeful life here, and then eternal life to continue with our Father in heaven. So he continues, and he starts talking about the wide gate first. He says, enter in by the narrow gate, but I'm going to talk about the wide gate now. So he gives us a directive. He says, for wide is the gate, verse 13, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. The wide gate is non-exclusive. Everybody's in. You're all welcome to come join. No matter what your beliefs, it's non-restrictive. There's no inhibitions. There's no rules. You just come in through the wide gate with all your sins, all your selfishness, all your prejudice, all your lust, all your hate, all your intolerance. In fact, you want to come in by all your works? Come in that way too because the wide gate is open for everyone to enter into. See, the wide gate is Buddha. The wide gate is Muhammad. It's Confucius. It's your works like the Pharisees to get you to heaven. It could be a formal religion, just the religion of it, Judaism, Catholicism, Methodism, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever it might be. The wide gate is Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism. The wide gate is Charles Russell, the founder of Jehovah Witnesses. The wide gate is Mary Eddy of Christian Science. The wide gate could be based upon your ethnicity. I mean, I'm a Jewish, that's my ethnicity, so I'm going to go and be with God. You're trusting in the wrong thing. They say, Abraham is our father. They're trusting in their... People might trust in the fact that I'm an American, their nationality. I mean, I'm American, obviously. I'm a Christian, right, because I'm an American. If that's what you're... That is the gate you're going in through, the wide gate. So the gate actually is where we're going. It includes atheists and agnostics and humanists. And he says, after you're going through the wide gate, you're going to continue through a broad way. He says, wide is the gate and broad or spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. So again, if you haven't gotten through the narrow way, the narrow, narrow gate, then you obviously have gone through the wide gate, and you are now in the broad way. It's a spacious path. Dalai Lama, he said, people take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. Just because they're not on your road doesn't mean they've gotten lost. I mean, it's really politically correct in today's world to believe that all religions are essentially the same and all religions are going to get you to heaven. See, today, the world that we live in today, there's a tremendous emphasis upon acceptance, upon broadness in one's beliefs. doesn't matter what you believe in, you're all on the same road, and we're all going to end up in heaven. That's what people say. It's a common view. And while that might be a common view and the politically correct thing to say, it is not the biblical thing to say. And the Dalai Lama doesn't pass the Jesus test because Jesus said 
that Dalai Lama and all those who hold this belief, they think they're on a separate road, but they don't know what they're talking about. Because there's only what? Two roads. There's only two ways. You're either entered in through the narrow gate and on a difficult way, or you've entered in through the wide gate and you're on a broad way. That's what Jesus said. So the broad way is wide enough to accept all false teachings, no matter who the teacher is. See, in the wide way and the broad way, you can have an appearance of righteousness, but never be inward what? Righteous. You can have this, this external actions showing how great you are, but you can have a stinky attitude. You can do all these things on the outside. In fact, the, the, the broad way lives in situational ethics. The right thing to do is all based upon the situation, not based upon the truth. The people on the broad way love those that love them. They love those people that support their beliefs, but they hate those people who don't. And we live in a world today that if you stand up for Jesus Christ, if you think it's been difficult before, it's going to be a difficult way now. See, it's, it's great enough for the immoral and the idolaters and the murderers, but you've got to realize there's going to be some externally moral, great people on that way. They go to church. Jesus, in a few verses in verse 21 that we'll pick up when I come back, says, not everyone who says to me here in Matthew 21, 721, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, in verse 23 says, and Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, people might think they're on the narrow way, gone through the narrow gate, that they're on this difficult path, but Jesus says, no, you're not. You've deceived yourself. You're still on this broad way head into eternal damnation. Well, Brad, you don't understand me. I'm very sincere in my beliefs. Won't being sincere, I mean, I really believe what I believe and I'm sincere about it. Won't that get me to heaven? The answer is no, because you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. Just because you're sincere doesn't mean I had many people knock on my door and enter a conversation, and I believe they really were sincere in their beliefs. But as we open up God's word, they were sincerely wrong. Those people have entered in through the wide gate, and they're on the broad way. Well, Brad, I'm going to do my best. How about if I just do my best? If I just do my best, won't I eventually get into heaven? No, that is, that is thinking you're going to get to heaven by works, just doing your effort. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Now look at this, not of what? Works lest any man should boast. See, all your efforts is not going to get you to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. It says in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness, all the things that we think are great are nothing but filthy rags. You cannot come to God based upon your own effort. You think you're on the narrow way, but the truth is you're on the broad way because you've entered in through the wide gate. It continues, and it says there in 13, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to where? Destruction. See, the wide gate and the broad way has a destiny, and the destiny is destruction. Again, you may think you're on the correct road, the right road, but that could be a deadly wrong mistake that you're making this morning. Proverbs 25, 16, 25 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Isn't that incredible? I, I think it's right. I, I believe it's right with all my heart, but you're wrong. That's a deadly mistake that you have. And that's why the, the, it's a wide gate and it's a broad way because it, 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 it says it, all the multitude can come this way. I think I'm right. I think I'm right. I think I'm correct. They think they're heading towards a vacation destination in paradise, but they're not. Their destination, it says, is going to be destruction. It's a, it's a fatal road. Proverbs 1, 6 says, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Hell is a place of outer darkness where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll be alone, separated from all that is good and that is right and that is holy, separated from the love of God forever. It says in 
2 Thessalonians 1.8, and there's many scriptures, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These people will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Well, I thought God was love. Why would a loving God, why would a loving God send me to hell? Well, God is love. But you've got to realize God is also just. And you've got to realize that God has provided a way for you not to go to hell. And that's, not, that's about as loving as you can get. But he is also just, and he cannot excuse and overlook sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. You see, if you're on the Broadway, you have a fatal disease, and that disease is sin. And as smart and as sincere as you are, you're going to be held accountable for your sin. And God says that you'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. And that's why this Broadway leads to destruction. You know, we can leave here today, and I think all of us know every day is a gift. We have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. And I would just pray that you would just make sure before you leave that you know what road that you're on. See, it says, wide is the gate and broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by in by it. You see, many, multitudes. Think about the last 6,000 years and the billions of people that lived on this earth. Most of them are on the Broadway. Most of them are ending up in destruction. It says many, only a few, only a few go in by the narrow gate. That's a heavy-duty thought. And the reason is because this Broadway, our human nature wants to go with the flow. Our human nature wants to be liked. Our human nature wants to be accepted. Our human nature wants to conform and just fit in and not ruffle people's feathers. After all, we hear everyone else is doing it, and the answer is that's true. Everyone else is on this road that leads to destruction. And that's pretty heavy. And if this was the end of Jesus' teaching, it would be kind of hopeless. Oh, my goodness. But it's not the end. See, we're going to be told here of the incredible love that God has for you and I. It says in verse 13, enter in by the narrow gate or the straight gate. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus tells his disciples, and you and I this morning, please enter in by the narrow gate. I thank God that in the midst of all that we're going through, Jesus loves us so much he provided another way for us. That's all what God has done because he cares for you and he cares for me. There's a way off this broad way leading to destruction. There's a narrow gate. And the gate is narrow. Now, you might have a different version. It's called straight, S-T-R-A-I-T. Not I-G-H-T. The word straight doesn't mean like it's going in a straight line. The word straight actually refers to a narrow passage. Many of you have heard of the Straits of Gibraltar. That's a narrow pass, passage that goes on through. So it's a narrow gate. Got it? It's, it's, a, it's a straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, straight gate that leads into a difficult path. So God is offering you and all of us this morning that if you're on this Broadway, there's a way off. You can enter in a different way, a narrow gate. Well, what is this narrow gate that Jesus is talking about? In John 10, 7, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And in verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be what? Saved. That gate, that door, is Jesus Christ himself. And what he has offered us through the death on the cross. It says, if you enter in by Jesus Christ, by me, you will be saved. Jesus is that narrow gate. He is the way that we get saved from the destiny of destruction. And I love it. If anyone enters in by me, in other words, this morning it is open to everyone. Salvation is a free gift offered to everyone. 
not a select few. Well, how do I know if, if, if God chooses me? Walk through the door. In your role, I see he chose you. He puts that responsibility on us to choose to walk through this narrow gate to receive what God has done through us, for us through Jesus Christ. When Jesus was telling his disciples that he was going to be going to heaven, going back to the Father, because again, just as I'd asked someone how to get to Bethel, who's lived there, Jesus came from heaven, and he's going to return him back to the heaven, and while he's here on earth, he tells his disciples, he says, where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to the Lord, we don't know where you're going. We sang that this morning, right? Thomas asked the Lord, how can we know the way? Those are great questions. Those are relevant questions that Thomas, how do I, how do I know the way? Where are you going? And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes through the Father except through me because I am the what? The door. I'm the portal that you have to go through to get eternal life. I am the truth, and I am the way. See, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into humanity and provided a way to rescue mankind from this terminal path that we are on. Isn't that great? That's good news. Justice requires that our sin be paid for. And God says that those that are on this broad way are heading for destruction, everlasting destruction from his presence. But God provided a cure for our sin. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace with God was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. You see, there's got to be a payment for a sin, and you either can pay for your own sins in eternal destruction, or you can receive what Jesus Christ took your sins upon him and paid the price. His great love for you guys is not matter what church you go to. His love for you is I want you to have a relationship with me. And when you enter in through that, that, that narrow gate of receiving Jesus Christ into your heart, you enter into a relationship with God. You know, the hippies of my day were seeking love, were seeking peace, were seeking truth. And the hippies of today are still seeking what? Love and peace and truth. And they're looking for love in all the wrong ways. So that's the good news. There's a second gate that you can choose. It says the rest of the verse of Romans 6, 23, while the wages of sin is death, listen to the other rest of the verse, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, I'm on this white gate heading for destruction because the wages of my sin has to end with destruction. But there's a gate open. There's a narrow gate. That gate is Jesus Christ. And if you accept the free gift of salvation that's offered to you, it's a free gift to you. It wasn't free. God the Son died for our sins. I hope you realize that. He took your sin upon him, suffered the wrath of God in our place. This is uncomprehensible to me to realize that, so we can enter in through this gate. So we have a second gate, and Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you and I. That's how much God loves you. Jesus did the unthinkable. He died in your place. He took your sins upon him and suffered the wrath of God. Now notice Jesus did not say, I am away. I'm a way, and there's all these other ways. He says, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. Anyone who enters in by me will be saved. It's an exclusive claim. No one comes through the Father through me. Well, that's a pretty exclusive claim. Well, you got to do something with that. Either Jesus is a liar when he made that claim. He's an egotistical liar filled with pride. Or he's a lunatic. He's not in touch with reality. He's off mentally. But if you don't accept one of those, then you've got to believe the claim, and he's what? Lord. He's either a liar or a lunatic, or he's Lord, but you've got to make that decision. If you believe he's a liar or a lunatic, then you stay on the Broadway. 
if you realize, my goodness, he is Lord. <clears throat> his life shows that. It's evidence. <clears throat> his life shows evidence of it. See, all religions and all beliefs do not lead to God. Jesus is the only way. Only Jesus leads to God, and that's why the door is very narrow. What about religion? You know, <clears throat> one of the most religious mans that we read about is a guy named Nicodemus. He was a teacher of the law, and in John chapter 3, he met Jesus in the night, and he asked Jesus the question, <laughs> this was a Jewish rabbi, what must I do to be saved? I mean, think about that. A religious teacher of the law is asking Jesus, what must I do to be saved? <clears throat> that is just an incredible thing. And Jesus says, you must enter in by the narrow gate. You must be born again. That which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. You must be born again. And that's what it means. It's receiving what God has, has done for you and accepting it into your life and being born again, born anew, born of the spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. But if you want to be spiritually reborn, you need to receive Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, no one comes through the Father except through me. So apart from a spiritual rebirth, there is no salvation. And that's why he's the only gate. That's why he's the only door. And those that enter in by him will be saved. <clears throat> See, while salvation is available for anyone, it's only available based on his terms. And that's why it is exclusive. You must enter in by the narrow gate. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. That's why you need to receive him and receive what he's done for you and say, I believe that. Now, I was 21 years old. I was raised Catholic. <clears throat> went through confirmation, went through communion and catechism and and believed in God, but I never received him. I said, Lord, I, I believe that for me. I want to have a relationship <clears throat> this morning with me. Let me get a drink of water. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son to be the door that we can enter into. And that whomsoever believes in him, receives him, will not perish, but have what? Everlasting life, we know that, but we see this a door that you've got to walk through, a gate that you have to enter in through. If not, the default is you are on this broad way. We just read a couple of verses in verse uh, 8 of chapter 7, for everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks the door will be open. See that gate's there, knock, and it's open, wide open, just walk on through, come on in. Please note that he says, in verse 13, when he says, enter in by the narrow or this great gate, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. A lot of people say, well, broad is the way and narrow is the way. Didn't realize that it says difficult is the way. It says difficult is the way. Afflicting is another word that you might have. <clears throat> the path of, that we're on by walking in through the gate, by making a decision to enter in through Jesus Christ and him alone, means that we're going to have a life that's going to be filled with some heartaches, with some difficulties, with some pain at this time. It's going to be at times a rough road, but you've got to realize it's always going upward. It's always moving towards heaven. And in, in this road, which you need to realize, while it's a difficult road, it is the most fulfilling, purposeful, joyful road you can ever be on, walking with our Lord Jesus. Amen? Now, you know, it's difficult at times. You're not accepted at times. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take consecration. And God's going to give us the strength, his grace, and the power to walk on that road. You know, many times you've got to realize that being on that road means that, that we are no longer living for ourselves. I love chapter 5, 6, and 7 as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's just been all about starting on that road. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, realizing we're spiritually bankrupt. It all starts there and realizing all that we have to go is moving on through. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but now Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live 
in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I love that emphasis. Who loved me and gave himself for me, who provided a gate for me to enter into. But I got to realize that I now identify with what he's done for me. And I'm now living for the Lord. And I'm saying, God, I, I, crucify my desires, crucify my wills, my wants. I was talking with someone the other day in and, and a situation, and they were talking about, well, I, I think I want this, and I think I want that. And I said, well, what do you think God wants for you? What do you have you thought about what God wants for you? And he's got the best path you can ever, ever have. What is his desires for your life? You need to desire and be crucified with Christ and let Christ live in you. So it's a life of crucifying our flesh, dying to our desires. It's also a life of living by faith. I like that. I live by faith in the Son of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't always understand, guys, why things are happening in my life. And you don't understand why certain things are happening in your life. Many times you guys might be, I, 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 I've been in some planes and some small aircrafts, and, and you, you know, you hit a patch, a fog, and I don't know if I'm right side up or upside down. And if you ask a pilot, they said, keep your eyes on the instrumentation, trust Trust what you're seeing here. Don't look on the outside. See, walking by faith is keeping your eyes on the Lord, keeping your eyes on, 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 on what you know is truth. I am the truth. And you're going to get through the cloud, this difficulty. It's living by faith and trusting God. It's also about enduring trials with the patience that God gives us. It says in James 1, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, when James wrote this, you need to realize he's written it to the Jews that have been scattered because of all the persecution that's coming upon their lives. That's what he's writing. That's what verse 1 talks about, to the tribes that have been scattered abroad. And he's saying to them, hey, you're going through some tough times. This is what I want you to do, guys. Count it all joy. That's hard to do. Praise God, I'm going through this tough time in my life. I've been praying about something. Yeah. Answer prayer, what? God said no. No's an answer to prayer, right? Parents, that's some of the best answers you can ever tell your kids, right? No, no, we're not going to do that. No. You can't have the bag of M&Ms for dinner. No. Why? Because it's not good for you. God does that for us also every single time. Enduring trials. And it's also a life, guys, living separated from the world, all these people that are on this other broad way. It says in Romans 12, when I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's the logical, reasonable things that you should do. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God in our lives. Present yourself a living sacrifice. Lord, here I am. Here I am, Lord. You know what the problem with a living sacrifice is? You lay yourself on the altar, but then you want to crawl off. You want to crawl off. Lord, do that work within my life. Help me keep my eyes. Help me. You know, the, we saw in the humanity of Jesus, Lord, if there's any other way, I don't have to, to die for mankind. If, if mankind could be saved any other way, let this cup pass for me, Lord. That's the humanity of Jesus. If there's any other way, I really don't want to, Receive the wrath of you upon my life. God, is there some other way? God said, was there another way? So what did Jesus say? Not my will, but what? Thy will. I'm willing to offer myself a living sacrifice for mankind. Thank you, Lord. Enter in by the narrow gate. It says it's the road that leads to life, which leads to life there in verse 14. See, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the moment you choose to walk through that narrow gate, you got to realize you now at that moment have life eternal. We think of so much eternal life as something that we're going to possess. We will possess life eternal, but eternal life continues and starts now. I love doing the funerals of of. of, of not that I love the two funerals. Of him. Oh, praise God, he died. Let's do a funeral. No, what I'm saying is when you know a believer has died, that means he's physically, his, his spirit has moved from this carcass here that's getting old and breaking down to a new one, living continually in his walk. We're, we're just going to continue our walk of eternal life with the Lord. 
That's what John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life that you may, that they may know you, the only true God, whom Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. See, the moment you know Jesus Christ, you receive him, you realize that you have life eternal. 1 Timothy 6, 2 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life for which you are called. Eternal life starts right now. And then it says, and there are few who find it. There's only a few guys who find it. When faced with, do I want to do that and this difficult, bumpy road and not be loved and accepted and, and criticized? No, most stay on the what? The broad way, the way of conformity, the way that everyone is traveling. And I like the fact that Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. He was honest and told them the truth. And not many are willing to pay the price to follow him. We read that in the Gospels, that after Jesus shared some things with them, it says many of his disciples left. People that were following him for all the wrong reasons, they left him. This is a hard saying. And I like the fact that just as he tells them, be careful of the wide gate, be careful of the broad way, he's now going to tell them that there are many people out there, guys, that will want to lead you on this broad way. They're out there. He continues, verse 15, and he says, now guys, now that I told you that, let me tell you, beware of false prophet who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravenous wolves. A false prophet is one who utters falsehoods in the name of God. They don't speak the truth. And the first way to combat a false teacher, a false prophet, is to beware. Be aware. That means be attentive. Do not be silly about all this. There's stuff going through all the airwaves that are filled with false teachings and false prophets, and we need to be able to recognize them. But it's hard at times to recognize them because they look like everyone else, and at times they sound like everyone else. You see, they have a cloak. They have a covering that looks like a what? Sheep. They sound like them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But they're really what? A wolf. They're really a wolf. Chris and Daniel have been teaching through the book of Jude on Thursday night. And Jude was the half-brother of Jesus. And he wrote his fellow believers in the first chapter. And he says in verse 3, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Why? Why why are you writing, Jude, that we must contend for the faith? This is the reason why. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. They've crept in. They're part of your body now. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. They're ungodly men. They've turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jude is telling the people there, beware, there are wolves that look like sheep and they've actually now crept in. Jesus warned you about this. He warned you about this. Beware. And you know what now Jude's saying? They're in. They're in the church. And you know what today? They're in the church. We need to be aware of that. They have an external cloak, and they look like a sheep. But the Lord is not the Lord of their life. They're not submitting to his will. They say things like, oh, Jesus is Lord, but they only believe he was a teacher. Many of these false teachers believe that he's actually a created being, or they believe he's an angel. They believe he's not one with the eternal God. They're false teachers. Many believe that they're saved by works not through faith and grace. They look like a sheep and they sound like a sheep, but they're not a sheep. They're greedy, destructive men. See, the word inwardly, it says they are ravenous, it talks about their soul, where they're coming from. They're not here to be nourished by God's word as you are this morning. I want to be fed. My soul needs to be fed. I had breakfast or I'm looking forward to lunch. That's great. But my soul needs to be fed with God's truth here. That's not what they want to feed on. You know what they want to feed on? You. They're greedy. They're selfish. 
They want to cause division. They want to cause disruption. They are harmful to men. They want to eat the sheep because that's what wolves do. And he's telling you and I to beware because there are people out there, their sole purpose is to hurt and to consume and to disrupt and destroy the body of Christ. They will try to look like someone else. It says in verse 16, but you will know them by their fruits. So how do you, how do you know a wolf that looks like a sheep dressed up with a sheep? Bah, bah, praise Jesus. But they're a wolf versus the sheep. How can you tell? He says, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Well, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is what? No. You know, the answer is no. Do men get grapes from thorn bushes? No. A grape vine is going to bear grapes. You know this is a grapevine because it has what? Grapes. You can tell it by its fruit. A thorn bush, that's the fruit of it, is thorny, is sticky, is prickly, is hurtful, is harmful. And that's exactly what happens there. So you can't say to someone, hey, this is a grapevine, and then you look at it and you see thorns. You're going to say, no, it's not. Look at the fruit. There's no, there's no fruit of grapes. It can't be a grapevine. It can't be a fig tree. It's got pricklies all over it. It can't be because the fig tree is nice and sweet, the fruit of it is. See, the nature of the tree is known by the fruit it produces. And you can tell the fruit, excuse me, the type of tree because of its fruit. See, the fruit that it produces will always be based upon the nature that it has. And a fallen person has no nature, has no capacity to produce anything that's going to be of the fruit of the Spirit. It might be false fruit. It might be an artificial apple. You take a bite of it, no good. You see, the nature of a tree is known by the fruit it produces. And it says in verse 17, even so... Every tree, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. In our lives, you've got to realize that every word and every action that we produce comes and becomes fruit that comes out of our heart. Bad hearts are going to produce bad fruits. And Jesus is giving them a guide for identifying who these wolves are. See, the false teachers are going to be speaking lies. Their actions are going to follow their inherent message. It's going to truly be anti-God, and so will their works. Now, Paul told the Galatians that without the Spirit of God in your life, you have a fallen nature, and the fruits that you produce will be nothing more than the works of your flesh. He actually says in Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of your flesh, these are of the fallen people without Christ in their life, are these. Adultery, fornication. They have a lifestyle of uncleanness, of lewdness, of idolatry, of sorcery, of hatred. They have a lifestyle of being contentious and jealous, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies. Envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, at which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things, they're on the broad way, right? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, the nature of a person is known by his fruit, and they're going to produce thistles, sticky things, thorns. That's what you're going to see when you watch their life closely. Well, Brad, aren't you saying that you have to Critically look at the people? Yes. That you need to be discerning? Yes. That's exactly. I don't want you to judge people's motives. But when you see sinful actions come out of their lives, then you better be careful. You better be careful. He says, do watch those things. When you see hatred and contentions and jealousy and selfish ambitions and dissensions and heresies, those are things that you see in churches. Those are things that you see what happens. You see hatred in the body of Christ. You know, why does that happen? You see contentions and jealousies and selfishness and dissensions. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Second Peter 2, 1 says, but there are also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destructive 
heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swish, dis, swift destruction. You know what happens if a farmer notices that the tree's not bearing? I thought this was going to be a walnut tree. It's not. It's, it's, it's producing something that's not a walnut tree. The fruit it's producing is not good. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is going to cut it down and throw it into the fire. It's useless. That's what a farmer's going to do. That's not helping anything. That's what God's going to do. <clears throat> These false prophets might look like you and sound like you, but they're not on the difficult path. They're on the wide path, the path that's the broad way. But it says if we turn and receive Christ, if we repent of our sins and enter in through the narrow gate, through the door which is Christ, that you will be a brand new creation. Isn't that incredible? A brand new creation with a brand new nature, born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, brand new creation. You're born of the Spirit. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And we start producing godly fruit, spiritual fruit. Our attitudes, our actions, our perspectives change as we walk along this difficult path, this path of eternity. And as our nature changes, so will our fruit changes because we're a new creation. We got the living God, the Holy Spirit, inside of our lives, changing us from what? The inside out. Lord, you changed me from the inside out. Lord, I'm having a real hard time with being gracious. Will you give me that? Father, I'm having a real hard time being loving with this person. Will you do that work within my life, God? An unconditional love. Not a scratch my back, scratch your back. But rather, no matter what they do in my marriage, I want to love my spouse. No matter what my kids do to me or my parents do to me, I want to love them unconditionally. That's the fruit of what? The Spirit, because that's not within our... Our, our fallen nature, that's within our new nature. You see, the fruit of the Spirit says in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, I'm having a hard time being gentle in my speech when I talk to my kids. Lord, do that work and help me be gentle in my speech, Father. Help me love them. Help me be aware of that. Lord, help me when I'm, when I'm dealing with this, this, this boss of mine or the, the situation up here at work. Lord, help me be kind. Do that work within my life. See, godly teachers are going to have good fruit. You're going to see them making disciples. They're going to be using their gift to benefit other people. They're going to be leading the lost to the Lord, loving the fellow believers, and not seeking to get attention for themselves, because every good tree bears good fruit. You know, verse 20 says, therefore, by the fruits you will know them. Know who? The false prophets, the false prophets, those that are on the broad way that would not want you to go in through the narrow way. You need to be aware of that. Pay attention to their manner of living. Pay attention for the content of their teaching. Pay attention to the effect of their teaching. Because there's many wolves who would not want you to enter in through the narrow gate. We can't be neutral about eternal life. There's no way. You're on one road or the other. If you're on the Broadway, I want to encourage you. Your eternal life is, is dependent upon you entering through the narrow gate. How much love can God show you? How, how much, what else can God do? He gave his only begotten son, his only son, to enter into humanity, to take your sins upon him for one reason, that we can have fellowship and relationship with God this morning, that we can have peace with God. We can have joy of the Spirit, regardless of the circumstances. That's what God wants to do in our lives. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, right now, Father, Lord, if anyone's trying to ride a middle road, may they realize there is no middle road this morning. That if we're on the broad way that we would desire to enter in, Father, to the difficult way, through the narrow gate, God, this morning. If there's anyone here who would like to enter through that narrow gate and say, Lord, I want to receive you and turn and for my sins and have you be the Lord of my life. Lift up your hand. Is there anyone here this morning? Thanks. If you're watching online, just say, Lord, I want you to come into my life. There's more to life than this, Lord. And I need you. I want you. 
And Father, I want to pray for the rest of us here, Father, that have entered to the narrow gate because they are on a difficult path, Father, and it might be difficult right now in their lives. I pray, Lord, that we would come to you, Lord, that we'd seek your will, Father. Pray for the unspoken prayers right now, Lord, that you touch their hearts. Father, they took the time to come and to hear of your word, Father. Fill them with your spirit. Meet them where they're at, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. Keep building.